Hey, uh, good morning, Defon. Hey, I am curious by show of hands, who went to sleep last night? Okay, most of you. Good. Um, hey, so I want to uh, thank you for coming to one of the first sessions of the day. Uh, there's more of you here than I expected, um, which is really cool. If you don't remember anything that happens here, that's okay. We're recording it, and uh, we'll release all that stuff for free later. So well, I'm going to have a fireside chat with Rob Joyce. Um, probably most famously known um, for memeing the Russians. No, I'm kidding. Rob has a really long history of a distinguished service for the United States. And, uh, and so I want to first have, he's just going to talk a little bit about where you're coming from, what you've done, and then we've got some questions and, and the concept is we'll have a conversation. Hopefully you'll learn something. And then uh, depending on how things go, we, we might have some Q&A. Sounds like a plan? Ready to do this? All good, Jeff. Okay, Thanks. go for it, Rob. Hey, good morning, everybody. So, Rob Joyce, I just retired in March after 34 years at the National Security Agency. So that was a career where I came... St Thank you. So, wild ride, interesting and exciting. I started there as a technical engineer, um, worked my way up to operational things, um, like during the Iraq War, I was the Iraq issue manager worked counterterrorism back and forth across NSA where we have two missions. One is signals intelligence. That's to produce the foreign intelligence against the adversaries to understand plans, intentions, capabilities, threats. Um, and, and that's a very traditional intelligence mission. But we also have a second side where you, you work to protect the national security systems. And those are systems that carry classified information, war fighting command and control, or intelligence. And so those are the most sensitive networks of the United States government. And so the, the dual nature of NSA, both playing offense and defense, kind of gives you a unique mindset. It really sets you up to, to think about um, you know, how uh, an offensive nation state would come at you. And by playing both offense and defense, you know, the, the old adage of it takes a thief to catch a thief changes the way you approach both defense and offense. And I found it fairly fascinating. And um, NSA is not known to be the easiest of places to survive. So just the number of years you served must mean you have some secret skill to survive in a bureaucratic, technical, competitive, you know, aggressive kind of environment. So I don't know how many of you ever read the book Soul of a New Machine. It's a 1980s book about the, the, uh, the PDP-11 designers up in the Boston Research Triangle. I read that years ago and there was something in there that stuck with me where people didn't focus on the next job. You focused on the one you were in and if you played a good game, it was like pinball, you got a free game, you got to play again. And that was kind of my focus. I enjoyed the jobs I was in, had multiple careers and jobs across those 34 years. Um, but it was very much focused on have a good idea, um, talk about that idea, and bring something to the to the effort, and then you get to do new, bigger, better and, things. And how do you organizationally? So normally in an organization that's very flat, um, you intern all over the place, and you have an idea of what's going on. But when everything is siloed, how do you know that you're just you come up with a great idea? It wasn't done five years ago you know, or it's not ongoing now. So before you can even propose a good idea, you don't maybe even have the information to... Yeah, it, inside the fence line, there's a lot of sharing. So, you know, everybody there has a clearance. Doesn't matter if you, um, you know, work the janitorial staff, the technical staff, the language staff, the cybersecurity teams, everybody has the same clearance. You may get some special accesses and some is compartmented, but overall, you know, it. it it's important to understand the greater mission and what, what we're trying to achieve. And so you do. Okay. So it's not just everybody in their one area, but oblivious to what else is. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So then, then you got your uh, big assignment. You went to Europe. Yeah. So I got to represent NSA in the uh, U S embassy in London. So um, being the cryptologic representative to the UK and in that, um, you know, it was awesome until COVID hit. So when you're a liaison and you're representational, not a lot of interesting things happen when you're in a total COVID lockdown. Yeah. 
And so did you gain a different appreciation of what, what the view from the outside is looking back at America? Yeah, so... From our, our partners or allies or... I, I don't care if you're at a company or a government agency, when you represent yourself to your partners, your customers, um, you, you understand different things about the way the organization functions and, and what it looks like from, from the outside, definitely. Yeah. So, um, so then you come back to the States? Yep. And then you were in charge of... The Cybersecurity Directorate. So Cybersecurity Directorate, which is most famous for its Twitter handle. Yeah, I, I did, you know, even, even before going to the UK, I had a tr Twitter presence. I worked um, to kind of engage, right? That's where a lot of the InfoSec timely information is popping out. And uh, I built a following. I had probably more positive and beneficial interactions with that Twitter handle than the official NSA handles. So the public affairs chief came to me one day and said, we want to give you an official NSA handle. And I told him, hell no, not even no, but hell no, because that means the lawyers get to decide what I can put out there. I'd have to go through the pre-publication review. Our public affairs officers would be pushing things at me to push out there. And, and it just wasn't a reasonable idea. So when they didn't expect me to say no, so they went away and thought, they argued with the lawyers, they came back with a four page document for me to sign that said you can have a official handle, you don't have to go through pre-pub review, but anything bad that happens is on you and you know the noose is around your neck. Right, right, it's a one paragraph and like four pages of rope to hang yourself. Yes, and, and I said, I'm already doing that, right, with my private one, so, so I agreed. I signed up, I started putting out some things, continued with edgy memes, um, you know, Jeff talked about, you know, a couple times taunting the Russians, things like that, but it was Cybersecurity Awareness Month where they came to me with this public affairs idea of all the boring stuff they were gonna talk about in October, and um, right. I, I, I just couldn't stomach it, and so uh, in a little act of defiance, I made a meme, the sweating guy with the two buttons, and it said memes or cybersecurity awareness, and I, I pushed that out, and it got good response and pickup, and I said, I can do this. You know, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is 30 days. I can engage with 30, 31 more, 30 more memes. Um, I did not understand how hard it is to come up with 30 good ideas because, you know, I wasn't doing them at work. I was doing them at home after hours. And I'd get home at 7 or 8 at night, burn out. I'd come up with an idea. I'd make a meme. I'd get up in the morning and ready to post it at 5 a.m. before I was going in the skiff. And I'd look at it and I'm going, holy crap. Did I think that was a good idea last night? Yeah, I, I, I can't put this on an official NSA Twitter account. And so we'd get something a little more benign. Um, but I learned that first year it was a lot of work and I had a couple people who informally helped, but the next year, um, I just kept, uh, a running log whenever I had an idea and started building up you got a year's stack. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I had material banked up and, uh, it went much better last year. And, uh, so did so. you pass the torch? You know, they're going to, is there a, a meme worthy the, successor? Well, Dave Luber is now the CSD director. He's debating about whether memes are CSD or memes are Rob. So I, I will certainly come out with uh, some memes in October. We'll see whether NSA is going to Oh, maybe a head-to-head. -head. Yeah, we could be. Complimentary. There's not uh, competition. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, when I hear that story, I think about the, the, the dilemma that we have sort of in cybersecurity versus hacking. Um, so in hacking, you get to hack when you feel like hacking, right? It's when you are... Um, opportunistically, the, the stars align and you're inspired and you hack and it's great. Uh, in InfoSec, you have to be professionally sort of creative all the time. You're on the clock. It's your page, you know, paycheck. And I, I remember in the dot-com days as we came into this era, some people can't be professionally creative. That's not who they are. And other people can. And I remember reading a story about this. It was, I'm not the first to ever even think of this. Disney animators, when animation went from a craft to an industry, the same thing happened. Professional illustrators, animators versus not. Okay, so let's kick it off. I've got to, there's a bunch of stuff going on. I think the first, just most topical thing, top of mind, because it's just so recent, it's, it's like hack and leak, Trump's complaining we, that somebody's coming after him, dumping his emails, like this, 
it's, it happens every election cycle now. Yeah, what what's old is new, right? And so if you haven't followed because you're in the DEF CON bubble, um, they announced uh, in the last 24 hours that the Trump campaign was hit with a hack and journalists started receiving material internal communications to the campaign. And, you know, the assumption is that we are in a cycle again with hack and leak already starting. And, you know, there's there's various opinions and conjecture about who it is. Um, you know, being here and not in the know, I, you know, I'm not going to take uh, take a guess at that. But, you know, the, the ones we've seen in the past, right, we've certainly seen the Russians involved in hack and leaks and focused on our campaigns. We've also seen the Iranians. There was a lot of work in the uh, in the previous election cycle to pre-bunk, meaning to debunk in advance before it came out some Iranian material focused on the campaigns. And China has also been involved in some of the activities. They've been a little more careful and, and uh, um, cautious in that space. But it is very clear and starting this early, it's, um, it's pretty surprising, right? I can't imagine, buckle up for October because I think we're in for a wild ride. Yeah, the, the October surprise. It's coming early. Uh, you, some, you mentioned pre-bunking. I'm really disappointed that, that, that pre-bunking is, is not terribly effective. You know, the studies show it's, it doesn't work as well as we'd hoped. So we're still searching for tools to deal with misinformation or dis malinformation. It's, yeah. What, one of the harder challenges is, you know, the Russians used to be awesome at creating disinformation. They would create whole storylines that, that would take people down a, a path now, unfortunately, they don't have to. They, their MO today is to pick divisive issues that have people already preloaded on both sides and just amplify the stuff that's naturally coming right. out of and, those and, communities. And they'll just keep loading up both sides. Yes. Like, they don't have to pick a side. And so I get frustrated when people tell me, like, but why would the Russians, like, support the, the liberals in France or whatever? It's like, you no, they, they support everybody. They just try to get everybody to fight. Yeah. Because they want the perception of chaos or real chaos, yeah, right? They they introduce it well. But I think don't they? They also com there's a boomerang effect, right? We saw that a little bit with COVID when it, they started fueling anti-COVID stuff for the West, and then it blows up, and now there's an anti-COVID movement in Russia, and it's like it comes back now. I yeah. think some of it when they try to take some of the technical issues, right? Often yeah. it's often it's um, you know more domestic, and they seem successful with those. Yeah. Yeah, well, they must have to have a way of preven preventing it from coming back at them. And you can see that in the APTs, right? If it's a Cyrillic keyboard setting, don't infect. Yeah. Um, so I, I've got to figure out a way to have two keyboards plugged in. Like, <laughs> yeah. Or add maybe just add Cyrillic as a language pack. You can, yeah. and that does work. Uh, that works. And then Chinese, and then I should just load them all. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so then, um, so the, one of the countries you mentioned, China, I mean, they're they're having a moment. They're um, they're getting pretty aggressive. Yeah. Um, you know, not just Volt Typhoon, but I don't. Emotionally, it was like, okay, it's espionage. You're doing recon. You're stealing secrets, which sucks. But now it's like you're preparing the battlefield, and that's not so cool. And so we're pulling their stuff out as fast as we can possibly pull it out, and it's going in as fast as we can find it, and it's it's. It doesn't seem like there's much public awareness about like how warm, not hot, how warm this effort is. And, and you've seen it probably much longer and can maybe contextualize it better for us. Yeah, so the, the, the reference Jeff's making is to a camp, series of campaigns that are coming at the U.S. If you look for Volt Typhoon in some of the media references going back um, as much as two years now where we've been chasing this... Um, hacking activity, mostly living off the land technology, where they're not bringing malware, but they're bringing techniques to gain access to networks. But it is the networks themselves that they're gaining access to, which is the differentiator. There's a set of them that are military related, things that we would need to respond to a crisis in, um, you know, in the Asian hemisphere. Um, so if China, Taiwan were to kick off, um, you know, what would we have to do? We'd have to move a lot of troops and material all the way from the West over into that theater. We would stage and go through Hawaii and Guam. And so there's, there's implementation of hacks into critical infrastructure in Hawaii and Guam. 
you can say that's you know military preparations but this campaign goes farther than that it goes all the way back to domestic us where the critical infrastructures like transportation aviation pipelines electricity are all being targeted with the same set of living off the land techniques and the intent there is not to disrupt the military but to create societal panic right there's there is there's language for that when you're trying to induce panic in a society and that's terrorism right this prepositioning literally is with the intent of being able to execute terrorism against the U.S. population. So we've moved um, far down the rabbit hole in this work where, um, you know, there's, there's set up for great power competition and preparations for conflict. It kind of sucks when you're, you're in this kind of a contest and we don't necessarily subscribe to those kind of rules. Like, we don't really behave that way. I'm hoping that we're breaking in and stealing all their secrets, but we're not stealing their corporate secrets. And it just feels like it's an uneven matchup, right? It definitely is. And, you know, that's one of the challenges is, you know, we're a society, a rule of law society. So, um, you know, one of the things the military does, we have a cyber command, but they are bound by the law of armed conflict. And that law of armed conflict says you're not going to create generic pain and suffering to a civilian population. So things like a water plant, an an aviation, general civilian aviation, um, electric grid, those are off limits because of the 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 broad nature and the unfocused and it's, it's, I guess China is very much, you know, dual use. Early days Russia and you know, single use. But now that the world's dual use, you really have to spend time, I bet, deconflicting. Like multi-tenant in a structure or building or a network stack, right? How do you, you have to have a whole team that does nothing but. Yeah, when when I joined NSA, you know, the world was simple. It was the Cold War, it was bipolar tensions, Russia, US, and the Russian things that we cared about were these bespoke military communications, bespoke government devices. And now, you know, the world's on Microsoft Windows. The, the world is on all of these major U.S. branded um, infrastructure between switches and routers and firewalls and other things. And so, yeah, it is definitely a dual use um, world we've entered. So, um, so what do we do? I mean, are the politicians sort of up to speed or are we organized the right way, do you think? Is it, do we need a, a new revolution or new way of, uh, you know, virtualization? Like, what are your thoughts on how do we navigate it besides just keep pulling their stuff out? Well, I think one of the big tools in the tool belt is this continuous engagement, right? You'll you'll hear General Nakasone was here, you know, as former director of NSA. He pushed this idea of continuous engagement that, you know, if you, if you think about a soccer field, um, you know, it's not a great strategy if the opposing team gets to shoot unlimited um, shots on your goal. Um, And you just have to play defense continuously and try to stop each and every kick. The idea that you've got to be out there and, you know, and and attacking into um, the far end of the field and bringing the pressure back to them so that you use multiple tools to go and take away their implants, take away their infrastructure, um, reveal their, their tools and intent, right? That's one of the superpowers of NSA. I mentioned that, you know, the, there's the intent by China to create societal panic. That, that intent is not something you find on an incident response activity, right? That's an intelligence policy um, uh, development where you understand them giving commands, orders, resources to execute this command. And that's where the public-private partnership is really important because, you know, the hyperscale cloud providers, the operating system vendors, the uh, the, the internet backbone uh, providers, they are going to see the activity um, and they actually are in a better position to do something about it, right? To do that community defense, to clean the pipes, to challenge some of this. But you need the the connection to that intent and you need the community to come together because no one element in that in that ecosystem the, so really can how, I'm curious how do how do you um, when you're inside how do you view open source intelligence there's just an unlimited of 
different feeds. You could spend all of your budget buying different threat feeds. Um, maybe give some people a, a, a way of thinking about how to orient to this unlimited amount of potential intelligence. And is it useful? You know, what do you? Yeah, it it's absolutely useful. Um, you know, because it's available and and um, you can get it through open source places. That's not where the special sauce of NSA is applied, right? But there's some point where you've got to bring together the ability to know things that are knowable in the outside with that special intelligence that you can only get from classified techniques. And so, um, you know, we actually started an organization, the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center, to bring the classified material out into industry where they could then find more examples of the tradecraft techniques, intrusions, or other things. Um, and, and they, quite frankly, are the ones who can do something about it. So uh, a lot of work to connect in that unclassified space where industry works. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, is that a widespread model, or is that kind of unique to the U.S.? Um, are we sort of taking pages out of other countries' playbooks? Because we're not the only ones under pressure. There's a lot of other countries being targeted as well. And so I, I'm guessing that's almost like this ecosystem of experimentation of like, you know, if I eat garlic, does it keep the Chinese away, you know, instead of the vampire? If I, you know, only route my packets through this, you know... What are people trying? Is it's it's got to be massive experimentation? Yeah. So so there's a lot of um, international collaboration, cooperation. Cybersecurity is really a cross-cutting issue that a lot of people can rally behind. But at the same time, the U.S. is unique in that you know you look at the technologists that gather at places like DEF CON, you look at the power of the Valley, you look at the major hyperscale. Cloud providers are U.S., right? So there, there is a responsibility to get the American industry involved because they're global multinational companies and they're the ones who can actually make sea change. But, you know, we've got friends and allies. You, you look at the U.K. has the um, National Cybersecurity Center and they um, have a lot of like-minded ideas and there's things that they innovate and, and flow over here. And there's things we do, they copy. You know, Israel is another example of, you know, a dense, um, technical, capable organization and somebody that's under threat, quite frankly, a lot of the time um, from their Iranian conflicts. So, um, you know, we learn from them because they're in the tactical knife fight each and every day. There's, um, there's this, I guess, interesting alignment uh, worrying alignment over the last year or two with with Russia and China getting closer and closer together. Um, so I'm wondering if you'll if they'll do they share these kinds of techniques in your experience, or do they when when countries get close to each other they still keep these keep capabilities separate and they just kind of support each other but they never merge. Yeah, I I think um, yeah there's still well there's there's common reasons for them to get together. Um, they still distrust each other a lot. And so we don't see the kind of collaboration that you do um, like with the Five Eyes countries. So you wouldn't see like something coming in from, let's say, a Russian kind of IOC signature, but really it's on behalf of... Yeah, don't believe you'd see that unless somebody's adopting tools to do false flags and, yeah. you know, change the scent. Because I'm curious, because in China, that's, you know, they, they do have their sort of rule of law, rule of the, you know, party... And in Russia, there's this big connection between the sort of organized crime in the state. I mean, you can't really sometimes tell which is which, right? And so those two models aren't really compatible, I don't think. I don't think the, the Chinese leadership would be cool with this, you know, arms distance criminals really running the, the show. And so it makes me think that um, ransomware and a lot of these uh, highly technical, sophisticated uh, crime operations seem to be mostly coming from Russia, right? They're not really coming from China. Yeah. There, so. there is a set of China um, that's active in it. Um, so if any of you saw the iSoon leaks, there was a company called iSoon got hacked and their data was dumped. It was really an interesting kind of case study into the Chinese ecosystem. They have a lot of independent companies who hack on their own but then market the things that they gather back to the Chinese government. So they don't get direct direction, 
they may get direction to build tools and infrastructure, but then those tools and infrastructure become dual use as they run their own ops. Um, we don't see kind of the same ecosystem happen in the in the Russian space where they do leverage the criminal ecosystem. Um, but in both cases, they provide this safe haven. They know the uh, the, the players. They um, they enable the players in that they certainly don't constrain them, but they also interact with them in different ways. Yeah, it's curious because you can watch what kind of prosecutions uh, or news coverages are happening in Russia or China, and you can see in the States you'll see prosecutions from computer crime all the time. Um, and maybe it's just not reported the same way there, but it just it definitely seems like the, the types of crimes that are getting reported or, or publicly talked about are, are quite different, which makes you think that either they don't care or they're using it you know, for recruitment or training or something's going on that's different. Yeah. Um, then those nation states do treat their hacker element as you know, a, a national asset. And they use them differently, but there's the spectrum that goes from the very official nation state, you know, you work for the military, the intel service, some special branch of the government to do intelligence operations or cyber operations in advance, all the way down through this quasi, I know and understand it's going on, I either task it or I just accept the benefits of it. All the way down to um, last couple of years, the interesting one is um, some of the hacktivist space where you get inspired by a national requirement Excuse me. and take action. I'm thinking, you know, the, the Russian hackers to Ukraine, the Ukrainian hackers to Russia, um, some of the Israel, um, Hamas, Palestine. Yeah, this is, is, is this, it seems to me to be pretty unique that a, a country would basically turn to the public and say, okay, Hack on our behalf. Go get them. And, and I'm going to tell an NSA story because it's unclassified. Um, years ago, there was this uh, uh, a meeting with the industry and folks at, at, uh, that NSA was hosting. And part of it was sort of the, uh, I think it was called like Cyber Red Dawn was sort of the theme. And the idea was, is there, they were exploring the concept, could there ever be a sort of Cyber Red Dawn? And if so, what would we do about it? And um, and my my observation was well if there is a cyber red dawn and we're under attack all the Microsoft employees are not going to go run to the hills and take up guns they're going to run to Microsoft and defend the networks right the people that understand their networks are going to defend their networks and then is the president going to get on television and say like network operators that know iOS 3.2.5 uh, point to these IP address ranges go you know. These people that understand Nokia, go. Like, how would that work? And what's you know? Um, so I really lauded them for the, the the thinking of it. But you know, in in the end, I'm so curious on like, they're just going to create noise, right? How how do you, unless it's a big public campaign just to embarrass them? Like, look, I got into a radio station. I don't see them actually having an effect, right? Beyond yeah. a public relations effect. Yeah. So. You know, in, in our world, again, I go back to that country, we're a rule of law. You, you're not going to see the U.S., um, you know, tasking people to independently take up arms, cyber arms for the government, right? The the idea of letters of mark and reprisal, all of those things. When I led tailored access operations, which was the hackers of NSA, we literally only used NSA civilians on keyboard and military um, on keyboard we would not use contractors. There's different organizations have different rules, but that nation state intrusion into another nation's sensitive network is so risky that you've got to own that, right? If it goes bad, literally you could see a State Department official, the State Department getting demarched. You could see uh, a White House press secretary or a senior official having to address the fallout consequences of a hack gone bad. And so if I'm controlling it at that level inside our operations, we're certainly not going to ask people to go up and take up cyber arms on our behalf. But the interesting space in this hacktivist motivational thing is we are also seeing Intel services kind of take official government action, but cloak themselves and create disinformation that 
it's being done by activists to kind of create the fog of war and shed the shed the attribution a little bit from nation state capabilities. Do you ever see um, in the activist? Do you see the useful idiots being employed a lot? Absolutely. It it ranges from that. You know, useful idiot through tasking to no, we'll do it and pretend to be an activist group. Oh man! So um, there's another group that um, it's much smaller, uh, the super empowered individual, and the super empowered individual really kind of came to light at the beginning um, of the Ukraine, the invasion of, by Russia of Ukraine, where the community got really distraught and wanted to get involved they wanted to do something right but not necessarily a call to arms go attack russia it was much more like oh no what can i do in my position where i'm sitting and you saw all kinds of community responses um i think the mongodb community said you know we've got this community platform but we're just we just let's have the the russian projects move away right you have a year to move away your projects we just we don't want them here um you saw different companies responding to uh, sanctions that were coming. So if you were, I don't know, Eugene Kaspersky, in a super empowered individual, he could order software updates, right? If he has had a bad day and wants to order an update to delete everybody's data, he could, right? Same thing, Elon Musk, if he wants to turn down off Starlink because he's having a bad day online, He's super empowered to wreck U.S. foreign policy, right? This this is fairly new. It's not a giant board of a corporation. It's not Boeing. It's one guy or gal. So like, how do you even deal with that? Yeah, I, I think we've got to look at the resiliency of our networks and, and the, the system of systems we've created, right? I think CrowdStrike was a wake-up call that, you know, it was not – a decision made, but an accident that then had massive repercussions, right? So you know that all the people who are looking at creating mischief on the internet are now studying that. What are those choke points? What are those ways in that if I cause pain at that point, amplifies and magnifies the effect I can have throughout? And so that's that's a place a super empowered individual could do something, but it's also a place where the 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 pressure of a hack or even the accident could uh, could ripple through our systems. Well, and also could work in reverse. I mean, I remember this is years ago, but there's this guy Larry who ran Spam House, and it's like, well, if you anger Larry, I mean, this is an example, but if you angle a anger Larry and he puts you in this black hole list, you just don't get email. <laughs> so you know, don't piss off Larry. Um, so. With these super empowered individuals, I think there's a um, there's another element coming in, which is like either personal responsibility or liability, and we're starting to see sanctions right uh, enter the field as a new tool, new option in a sort of a diplomatic tool belt. And um, the example I always bring up is uh, there's a skirmish on the border between China and India. There's loss of life on both sides. India is really upset. But instead of engaging in more armed conflict, they go and ban TikTok from their app store. And, uh, and TikTok says, oh no, that's $6 billion in revenue, we're doomed. And China says, we'll retaliate, we'll ban, oh, there's no Indian apps because we don't allow them in the app store in China. It's asymmetric, right? They, they didn't have a method to respond. And so I think now there's also new tools emerging in the toolbox that, that didn't exist a few years ago. Are those... How do you, do you ever get involved in the discussions about, no, no, select this tool. Okay, yeah, we'll hack it if you want us to, but you should maybe really try this other option first. Yeah, no. Uh, my first response in a lot of the policy discussions, right, when, when I was at the White House or when we're talking to the White House in, in operational space, is usually the best response to a hack is not to hack straight back, right? The, the answer of, I'll bring a bigger cyber stick to somebody is usually not the answer. Um, the U.S. has a whole quiver of different tools, and it ranges from sanctions to financials um, to name and shame to diplomatic pressures to indictments to all of these other things. And 
you know, it, it, it needs to be this tapestry of a solution. Um, there is no one thing that is going to make, um, you know, the Chinese PLA say, Ooh, you know, that was too hard. I'm going to stop and, and just, uh, make my, my, my hacking entities go away. We're done with hacking forever. Right. So you've got to get to the point where you add that friction, the continuous engagement, so they can't be as successful all the time. But you also want to do some things to think about the decision makers, right? Everybody in those official structures has a boss all the way up to the leader of the country. And if their hacking operations are bringing pain to the people who are their bosses, whether it's, hey, I gave you, you know, this massive pile of money and you failed, or I gave you the authority to do this hack and you got caught and embarrassed me and now, you know, our ambassador is responding to a demarche or, you know, we've been called out for this global campaign of hacking critical infrastructure and, and you know, it is, it is disparaging us in the world's eyes and causing us, you know, uh, reputational problems. Those things stack up to where the authorities constrict, the money constricts, the the chain of command um, is much more involved and adds bureaucracy into that space. You want to add the friction, but in the end, you've got to get to human beings who make decisions. And there's a lot of tools for those human beings um, to stop. So um, I want to go back. We were talking about uh, a mutual friend, Tony Sager. Um, and I use this quote Tony said, I don't know how many decades ago, but he said that um, you, can't, uh, you can't defeat your opponent one-on-one -on -one because of the, just the population disparity between uh, different countries. So you have to automate. And so we try to automate as much of we, everything we can. We, we look at everything, we create automation, we try to automate everything we could possibly automate, and then we try to automate the rest because there's just not enough humans. And that was a long time ago. Tell, us, tell me about your, your thoughts around automation, automated defense. Like, how do you free up your operators? Like, what do you think the highest useful purpose of a human is in this chain? And how much of it can be automated away to let them focus on that truly human aspect? Is it the risk reward? Like, you need a human to make this decision? Or. Yeah, what I found is the, the humans are the creative element. They're going to find the new and novel thing that slips through the cracks. And whether it's the, the, the criminals innovating or whether it is the, um, the, the, the defenders innovating, it's going to be the case where, you know, that innovation is going to move the needle and change things. But I do think we are at, um, we're at an inflection point right now where, um, you know, generative AI, large scale machine learning um, is just going to increase the pace and speed. As you've looked over the last several years, the time from knowledge of a vulnerability in a POC hitting the internet to the amount of exploitation has just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And, and you know, I also think we talked early about the Chinese living off the land campaign in Volt Typhoon. Um, we're going to need machine learning to baseline what is normal and find the anomalous things because of the stealth and quietness of those activities. So, um, you know, I believe that the automation is going to start to address the machine speed attacks, and we're both going to see the, the ratcheting on either side um, moving towards speed and scale needing that automation. Okay, so we've got, uh, if I'm reading this right, what, we have 11 minutes left. Is that correct, everyone? Five, uh-oh, well then let's take one question. Yep, you gotta get closer to the microphone.
you want to kind of repeat the question? Yeah. For so so I'll, I'll summarize a bit of what I heard, which is, hey, there's a lot of different organizations in the U.S. that are part of the puzzle for cybersecurity. And, you know, whether it's DHS, CISA, FBI, NSA, um, DOD, you know, where are the lanes, who's the orchestrator, and, you know, how does the change in the political environment, especially, you know, if we have a new administration, change all of that? So we have been getting better. I won't say it's perfectly solved and all the gears are in, in complete synchronicity, but you know, there's strengths and weaknesses in each of the agencies and we're starting to get a rhythm where we know how to play to those strengths. Um, and you'll see things like campaigns where we have multiple agencies involved in that. You know, FBI doing domestic stuff with their legal authority with DOJ, um, combined with Cyber Command doing some extra outside the U.S. activity to do takedowns in conjunction with FBI doing the internal U.S. CISA working with industry and doing that campaign to synchronize the things that are across uh, the, the, the civilian infrastructure and then NSA lending technical expertise and foreign intelligence um, into that mix. And, and we're getting better and learning over time on how we do those. Um, the, the National Cyber Director was created to kind of be that band conductor across all of them. And so, um, you know, we've got that, that, that apex. Um, in reality, you know, a lot of the, the activity today um, is ground up. And, and when I say that, I mean one agency has either a special um, insight, a special relationship, a team that's been working, and then they start to bring the players in that can collaborate and add to that mix. And then, you know, the, the, the uh, ONCD and others then do the convening to bring us all around the execution and synchronization. Um, that that because the roles are enshrined in statute and law and policy, um, you know, will continue throughout administrations. The nice thing about um, cybersecurity, it's something that's fairly bipartisan. Um, everybody can get behind the need to stop foreign adversaries into our spaces. So um, I, I am uh, optimistic that the trajectory continues. The biggest shortcoming, and I heard an ask about the shortcoming I see today is, you know, the scope and scale of the threats against the resources and, you know, the innovation that comes um, from the attackers into the vulnerability space. And you see a lot of effort into we've got to get to the point where we do the things we know matter Right, we've got to get on two-factor authentication. We've got to get companies um, building more secure software. We've got to get out of some of the memory unsafe languages and get the core technologies over into things that uh, that are defendable and defensible. And then um, you know we've got to we've got to build the staffs and teams. And I think Jeff, to your question about automation, you know the the scope and scale is so hard on some of these threats. And you know, having a big enough team to defend 24/7, and who wants to work that graveyard shift in the middle of the night on a holiday? You know, automation helps take the pressure off some of that. So I like the trajectory we're on. It is a journey, though. It is a long journey, and we're just um, we're we're on the path. All right. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for your service. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and we'll see you around the con. Appreciate it. Thanks.